This is Smart Women, Smart Power, a podcast that features conversations with some of the world's most powerful women. I'm very focused on providing the right capabilities, the equipment. Yeah. I also know that it's really about the operator is the most important thing. And then also to do that, I, I can't do this alone. We feature thought leaders at all career levels, where we explore, among other things, the many contributions that women make to the fields of international business, national security, foreign policy, and international development. Does having women in positions of power influence the outcomes of decisions in these fields? Why or why not? Join me, Dr. Kathleen McInnes, director of the Smart Women Smart Power Initiative at the Center for Strategic and International Studies for these incredible conversations. I'm joined by Melissa Johnson today, who's coming to us at Smart Room Smart Power all the way from Tampa, where she is uh, an acquisition executive for U.S. Special Operations Command at MacDill Air Force Base. So thank you for schlepping all the way up from Tampa, <laughs> Melissa, and thank you for being here today. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. This is really great to be back up in D.C. Yeah. Awesome. So before we started recording, I mentioned that... It Back in the days of yore, I worked in the Pentagon in the Special Operations Low Intensity Conflict Office. And so SOCOM is one of the key actors with which SOLIC would, would work, you know, for obvious reasons. So I'm just thrilled to be able to talk to you. So for, for the benefit of our listeners, when you think about the Department of Defense and you think about, you analyze what's happening, so much comes down to where the money is spent and the authorities that different components have to spend it. So, Melissa, you're sitting in this place, in this institution within the DOD bureaucracy that has a, a fairly unique set of authorities and resources to accomplish some pretty, what we used to call secret squirrel kinds of missions. So I'd love to your take like, of explaining to our listeners, how does SOCOM think about those kinds of authorities and resources and, and, and what what you do with them. No, absolutely. It's a, it's a great question because Special Operations Command is unique. Mm -hmm. And so there's kind of two veins in this. Special Operations Command, from a combat command perspective, mm -hmm. they are one of multiples, um, right. strategic command and opaque command, right? So you have the geographic combat commands and you have functional combat commands. And combat commands for the, our listeners, the, the, the four-star level commands where like a bunch of different services can tr contribute to, to the fight. To the fight. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. so Special Operations Command obviously is global across mm -hmm. the world, special operators from all services that come to go provide those forces. Along with those operational authorities, Special Operations Command is unique because it also has acquisition authorities, almost service-like authorities. So right. think of something akin to the U.S. Army, the Department of the Navy, the Department of the Air Force. And where that really comes into play is the delegation from the Secretary of Defense through Title X mm -hmm. law down to the commander of Special Operations Command, down to me as the execution agent to do all of the acquisition work, such like in the Air Force, the Army, and the Navy. So we develop, procure, and sustain anything that is peculiar to yep. Special Operations. Okay. Oh, here's a great example, and it's kind of the easy one, especially with my Air Force background. The Air Force buys C-130s. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what we will do is Air Force will buy the C-130 with Air Force funds. Yep. yep. We will have our own funding for Special Operations Command that sanctioned offers purely for us to go to use as resources. And we will put in the modifications that support Special Operations. So whether it's special type of sensors, mm -hmm. special equipment for the pilots, the navigators, anything that would be an enabling function for a special operation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So a lot of times we will modify service equipment. Sometimes we are organically procuring things that only special operators would, would utilize. Right. So, so that's really where the uniqueness comes in. But we have such a great relationship with the services. One of the soft truths, which we call, which uh, mm -hmm. General Fenton, the commander calls is, you know, humans are more important than the people and we can't do it alone. We have right. to rely on the services. So 
you know, while we are very focused on, I'm very focused on providing the right capabilities, the equipment. Yep. I also know that it's really about the operator yeah. is the most important thing. And then also to do that, I, I can't do this alone. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I, we don't have the resources financially sure. to do it in a vacuum. Right. We need the relationship and the partnership with the Army, the Air Force, the Navy, the Space Force, the lab, the national laboratories. So, mm -hmm. I mean, we have a very large ecosystem of partnerships that we collaborate with. So that's actually really one of the fun things about the job is just, it isn't just us in a vacuum. It is truly that collaboration across the greater Department of Defense and, and the interagency community. You know, I always have the impression that like the, the SOCOM acquisition authorities are almost the envy of the rest of the department because you could do so much so quickly. And it's, it's, all focused on the very, very pointy end of the DOD sphere, right? It's, I mean, it's just incredible what you've been able to do and turn around. It's some, you know, acquisition programs take decades and you guys can, can move faster than that. Yeah. So I think to that point, we don't actually have anything special compared to the services, sure. which is kind of one of the myths going hmm, uh, okay. to the point, like we can go fast. Yes. We actually have the same Department of Defense regulations, mm -hmm. but, but what we really do, it's a business practice and a culture. Interesting. And okay. And, it, okay. and I would say that, oh. you know, if you look at the the Department of Defense's acquisition guidance that they yeah. put out. Yeah. Which is voluminous. It is voluminous, <laughs> right? Um, if you read every page. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you look at page one. Yeah. And you read the first page of the document, it actually says the tailor. Interesting. Right. Which is sometimes people, they get so focused on all the other pages and we really take that to heart. And so what, what SOCOM does and what my predecessors have done is take and go, let's not modify, but let, let's extract. And instead of tailoring out, because mm -hmm. I think that's really what yeah. big DOD acquisition kind of does. You, you have this guidance and people say, okay, tailor, but you're tailoring things out. Okay. But what we do is we start going like, what do you have to tailor in? Right. Interesting. So it's really kind of flipping the model on its head. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, the authorities are the same. Right. I right. still have to follow federal acquisition regulations. Right. I still have to follow all the Title 10. So I don't have any special, you know, right. waiver or yeah. get out of jail free right. card. <laughs> yeah. That's how it's so interesting. The insight is that it's very cultural, right? Yes. And thinking about how to use the defense, you know, federal acquisition regulations as a way to start to say yes, as opposed to like lots of reasons to say no and slow roll things. So what drew you to the world of national security? Well, that's a great question. Thanks for asking that. So if I go back to, wow, this is really kind of the way back machine uh, <laughs> when I was in college. So growing up, I used to always think that I wanted to be an astronaut. I was always fascinated oh, wow. with airplanes and just anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, my brother went into engineering in college and he's uh, about eight years older than me. So I kind of, you know, always watched him. Yeah. And, and so he went into commercial airline industry as an engineer. Okay. And okay. so he does a lot of manufacturing engineering. And so by the time I got to college and so I went down the engineering round, so I have an aerospace engineering degree. And at the time, so this is now late, not late, mid nineties, when I was getting ready to graduate from college and just the times in the nation of where we were from a national security, there was a lot of companies starting to um, lay off people. Yeah. And so one of the things I was talking with some friends in college and some of them were in ROTC mm -hmm. and I never did that. I thought about it, but I didn't know I wasn't ready to commit. Sure. So I just said, okay, well, let's just kind of see how this goes. And by the time I graduated from college, I just kind of had this, I don't know, call it like an internal feeling, call it a calling. Sure. Right? Sure. Sure. To go, I wanted to do something bigger than myself. Yeah. And I applied and went to officer training school in the air force and mm -hmm. became a second Lieutenant. And with my engineering degree, they made me an engineer slash program manager. So the okay. acquisition yep. community. Okay. And I grew up in that for just under 25 years wow. when I retired as, mm -hmm. as a Colonel in the air force. And so to turn to the decision you brought to, to us today, which is your role in setting up the Air Force's Advanced Battle Management System, which 
for those who are closely following the ins and outs of, of procurement and acquisition programs, it was a probably facing a couple of hurdles along the way, you know, just to put it mildly. Yeah. So um, for the benefit of both me and our listeners, could you break it down? Like, what is this system and why did it matter? A absolutely. So I think you have to come to start like big Department of Defense. Okay. So there's been, I'd say, and I'll probably get the timeline wrong, but I'd say for at least five years, there's been this energy to say, I've got all these different systems, mm -hmm. airplanes, ships, ground vehicles, sensors, a commander downrange, right? So take any of the, the commanders downrange and anywhere across the world to make a decision quicker and more accurately. What we were finding is going, if people are only getting information from one system mm -hmm. and then separately information from another system, there's usually a human in the loop doing a lot of manual work to fuse information together. Which is no small feet. Right. That's a lot. That's a lot, right? Comparing, concerning the amount of data that comes in from different mm -hmm. systems, whether it's satellites, airplanes, whatever it is, the department leadership is going, how do we make that easier for the human mm -hmm. through the process and the commander at the end of that process to make a wise decision for whatever that decision needs to be? Right. Whether it's an intelligence decision, whether it's there's some action, kinetic or non-kinetic, that needs to take place. So the department said, we are going to start looking at all domain and how do we have an all domain capability for command and control? Mm -hmm. And how mm -hmm. do we start meshing these things and connecting sensors together? Yeah. So each of the services kind of has their offering. So back in 2019, before I went back to the Air Force, so while I was still active duty mm -hmm. and down, actually I was down at Special Operations Command in my last active duty assignment, the Air Force was working their, their piece of it. And they had a lot of great technical experts looking at how would we go do this. Mm -hmm. So now you fast forward and I get to, I retire off of active duty. I return to the Air Force in late October of 2020. And all of a sudden, a couple of really kind of crazy things happen. Mm -hmm. I'm about three weeks into the job. <laughs> and uh, my boss, who I've known for a long time, we worked mm -hmm. together 20 years ago. Great, great guy. Had a, just unfortunately had, had a medical event. So now oh, I'm no. three weeks into my new job, three weeks into being a senior executive service, like relearning the organization, mm -hmm. learning the job. And now all of a sudden, I'm kind of thrusted into this acting director job. Now, the good thing is I had a lot of great support. I had an amazing mm -hmm. team, yep. though it is still the middle of COVID. So like, <laughs> so, so everybody's so, wearing so, a mask. So, so, so half like, the people like, I think I know you, but I don't actually, I don't know what you look like. Um, <laughs> I had great leadership in the Pentagon mm -hmm. under, you know, Air Force acquisition who were very supportive, who I've known. And so they, they all had my back, right? Okay. So it wasn't like I was out there alone and unafraid. Sure. But right within a week of that happening, kind of my boss's boss basically said, hey, we are going to shift. And the folks that were working really this technical pieces of advanced battle management system going like, great work, but it now has to get into a program office to really take and set a solid foundation and mm -hmm. taking this to the next level. So mm -hmm. we inherited that. And he said, you've got 60 days to get me that initial strategy. So holy crap. So, so, so now all of a sudden I'm learning a new job. I mean, it's an organization of about 500 people. We're doing all this classified work, billions of dollars worth of development production work. Mm -hmm. And then we get this levied on us. And so, so we're kind of <laughs> and pulling and that team together and, you know, talking to my boss while he's at home recovering and trying to do a little bit of, you know, as he's trying yeah. to do a little bit of telework, right? It just was a very interesting few months starting a new career and it was really trial by fire. <laughs> sure. Well, and there's also congressional interest in this. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> like, oh, absolutely. So and there's a lot of it because on this is, if you're not building a thing, right? right? You know, to be able to describe, hey, I'm building this new airplane. I'm building this unmanned vehicle. I'm building mm -hmm. this ship. I'm building this, this electronic warfare box. Those are very easy to describe. You can put a picture on it. You can yep. have very tangible things. When you're talking about, hey, we're going to connect things in a command and control 
what do you really show, right? In, right. In, in the tangible aspects. And that was so always- it's like a, a, a PowerPoint slide with like a wire diagram. Well, like it's like right. not, not the most compelling. It's, it's not, right? Visual, so right. really working the narrative, one, convincing ourselves, are we actually doing what we need to do? Yeah. And it's really the underpinning architecture, which, you know, for most program offices and, you know, just I think anybody in the department, I shouldn't say anybody because I don't know, but I mean, mm-hmm. a lot of the folks within my community, I right. would say that, you know, that's not the most exciting thing to work. Yeah. But it is probably one of the most foundational things you have to work. Right. Because I mean, it's a lot of really um, intense systems engineering, critical thinking, going, do we understand what we need to connect, why, and what is the intended output of it? We can barely get walkie-talkies to talk to each other, much <laughs> less like ma- major systems across right. services. And then forget the whole like allies and partners dimension of it too. Like it's just a crazy amount of stuff that has to be synchronized and we're, it's very, very hard to do. It is. <laughs> right? and, it's, and it's not a sprint, right? It is, right. A, it is a marathon. It is at a very quick pace mm-hmm. and it is definitely complex. And, you know, there's a lot of, there's, I mean, it's not easy. If it was easy, it would have already been done. I had an amazing team. I mean, they really worked and overcame a lot of just hurdles in getting that initial strategy. And yeah. again, you know, and it got to the point where we got it, my team got it on a, a good footing to the point where, you know, a couple of years, well, I'd say, yeah, about two years later. So now we're back in 2022, mm-hmm. where, you know, as leadership changed out in the administration, new Secretary of Air Force comes in and he's like, hey, this has got to scale. And, um, and like, and yeah. really, and, it, and, it, and, it, and staying in my organization that I worked in, it just, we didn't have the bandwidth, right? So he's right. like, so he set up a whole separate office and, you know, having that transition, but still very close connective tissue was totally the right answer mm-hmm. uh, because you have one, you just have an immense amount of stakeholder management because you're working with so, so yeah. many people, not just within the service, but across the services and to the operational mm-hmm. community. So it is, again, it's a yeah. long journey. We're doing the same thing within the command. Yeah. We're, we're now going... Hey, I told you I got things on undersea, surface, sea, mm-hmm. all the way up to space. Yeah. How do we start to connect those things, to, the right, right things together so that the operator, wherever he or she is at, yeah. are they getting the decisions as quick as possible? And can we take, can we automate some of that information so it's not all this manual process? Yeah. yeah so, yeah. you know, yeah. integrating advanced algorithms and artificial intelligence, machine learning, yeah. like all the things that everybody's hearing about these days mm-hmm. going, no kidding, we have to, we have to implement those things in a, in the proper way so we, that we can get the output. So again, leaving the decision yeah. maker to do that only what they can go do. Was there any specific things that you did in terms of like, so you, you issue the strategy or produce a strategy within 60 days, which is like warp speed, right? Mm-hmm. Like that's crazy um, in, in DOD terms and absolutely amazing. So, so you set that up and then you work to to recast perceptions about this program right. and within Congress and with other stakeholders. Were there any lessons learned or any things that you did specifically that, that you found quite successful? Yes. You know, I think it's communicate early and often. Okay. Right. Yeah. You know, you get, and it's not just with one people, it's within all of your stakeholders and, yeah. and getting it's it's really building that coalition. Right? Yeah. So there's the internal, like at the time it was the internal to the Air Force and the Air Force leadership. And yeah. it wasn't, hey, I'm gonna brief you today and then I'm gonna come back in two months and brief you. Like we were on a mm-hmm. weekly battle rhythm talking wow. with the senior leadership, with the vice yeah. chief of staff, with the head of Air Force acquisition, just to make sure they were understanding what we were trying to do and we got their feedback. So again, yeah. it, it is a team effort. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, then yeah going to the Hill and briefing the professional staff members yeah. and congressional members. So they understood. And cause again, they, you know, as you know, congressional mm-hmm. staff members see so much information from all the services, all the oh, agencies, God, yes. and they're consuming so much. It's so a you tsunami. Have, of right, information it is a tsunami, right? So breaking it down in a way that whether you're an engineer, whether you're a staffer, whether you're a contracting officer, no matter what your career field is, you can understand what the intent is. And mm-hmm. you know, that, that strategic and executive communication I've always found is the toughest thing to work out, right? And, yeah. and it kind of tests ourselves. What we're saying, is it what we mean? Mm-hmm. Does this actually make sense? And, yeah. and really working through that, investing in that relationship and the transparency with the Hill of where we're 
where we're having challenges and how we're working through those, I yeah. think is always the best way to work through those types of issues. So to wrap up our conversation, do you feel that your gender as a woman has had an impact on this decision and how it played out? And if so, why? And if not, why not? Yeah. You know, I think, and maybe I just, I've been in this environment for so long. I don't think it did. Okay. And the reason why is as a leader, I'm going to make decisions and and grow my team and guide mm -hmm. them and take feedback from them. To be honest with you, I think that's just being a leader. Okay. Right. Yeah. I didn't always make, you know, sometimes they had to correct me. Sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, I had to guide them, but I don't think that being a woman had anything to influence that. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been in this, in the national security environment for 28 plus years. Yeah. Um, I, I hope that people look at me is that they give mm -hmm. me the respect because I've, I've earned it because I've delivered and produced and I lead well. And, you know, we're all growing as leaders, right? You never yeah. kind of get to that place where you can just stop growing. I mean, I'm still growing as a leader. So, so I don't think that that actually had an effect on it. Well, thank you so much no, Melissa, thank for joining you. and like for walking us through not a special operations command, but this incredibly complex, but the future of war fighting, you know, capability. And also from, from, for, again, from the, for the benefit of our listeners, like Melissa's in a position that is critical for how the Department of Defense operates and how it gets things done. You're like at the central node. So having this insight is just absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This has been great. Subscribe to the Smart Women Smart Power podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to great content. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at Smart Women, or you can follow me on Twitter at KJ McInnes One. Thanks for listening and join us next time.